hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a Beatles podcast, a weekly program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show that centers on what's going on in the world of the Beatles, newswise, and from week to week, that can cover a lot of ground because, especially now, these are busy times for Beatle fans. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, and that is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everybody. On today's show, we have yet but another special guest to join us on the phone. And um, this is someone that Beatle fans have heard about for quite a while, and I don't even know if he remembers, but I actually interviewed this author uh, 25 years ago when he had uh, the book Tell Me Why come out. And that was a study and an analysis of uh, the Beatles' music and their history. Tim Riley is our special guest on the phone. Hi, Tim. Hi, how are you guys? We're doing great. Uh, We have you with us because... Uh, not long ago, you put out a book on John Lennon, a biography simply titled Lennon. So I thought we'd talk about the book and uh, get your take on uh, all things about John, his career, his life. And uh, I thought that I'd start uh, the program by asking you about the new book. With so many books having been written about the Beatles and about John, uh, what does your book have to offer that sets it apart from other books on John? Well, I felt that um, although there are quite a few books um, out on him, the, the, the Lennon catalog itself actually breaks down this way. We have, we have Albert Goldman, who came out in 1988, which is completely dismissible in my eyes. I mean, it's just a very wrong-headed take on everything. A lot of mistakes, a lot of, lot of myths, a lot of blather, you know, way too long, an obvious contempt for his subject from the word go, and... You know, just a real horror. I mean, I had to I had to reread that book when I started my book, and it was just awful. I mean, it's just a horrible, horrible read. And as uh, Lennon fans, we all know everyone hates that book. Mm-hmm. But it was it did very, very well. You know, and a lot of people think that's the story. Um, and so I wanted to really do a corrective to Albert Goldman. Since then, we've had an, the other major biography uh, was by Philip Norman, and that was what I think like two thousand eight. And that was very much the British angle on John Lennon. And we also had Ray Coleman, and uh, so that and Ray Coleman, of course, comes out before Goldman, and his is a British angle, and his chief source was Cynthia Lennon. So we had two British biographers, and we only had one American biographer, and the American biographer was so weak that I just felt like we really need to do the American perspective again, and we need to do it right. And then as I was working on it, this theme really took on a different hue, which was there really is a very interesting dialogue going on here between the American source, the American roots of rock and roll, and the British uh, invasion, the bands who, like the Beatles, adopted rock and roll as their own over in Britain, and how, how they emphasized different things and how rock and roll really changed and grew when it became an international language through the Beatles. And so that really became one of the major themes of the book. And Lennon has this very interesting relationship with England and with America. And the British have a very different view of Lennon than Americans do. And I really wanted to explore that. I thought that was really interesting material. And the other weakness that all of these Lennon biographies share is that they're, they're not really very interested or um, passionate about the music the way he was. So one of the things I wanted to do was to draw a picture of rock and roll history through Lennon's ears and just try and get as close to the ground as we could as to what it was like being the young teenage John Lennon, hearing rock and roll for the first time, what it meant to him, and how he then went on and absorbed it and grew up with it and went on to change it. For your, your mention of the teenage uh, John Lennon brings up an interesting question, Tim. What did you think of Nowhere Boy as... Um in telling the Lennon story? You know, I thought it was sort of a, a, respectable, um, a respectable piece of work from a director I really liked, and I liked the acting a lot. I thought the script was, you know, a little bit too kind to Aunt Mimi and a little bit too overboard on Julia. That is, they made Julia about 20 times more flirtatious than they needed to to emphasize her flirtatiousness, and they made Aunt Mimi... You know, because 
and I think mostly because Yoko Ono was involved with the project, they made her kind of, they kept the halo over Aunt Mimi. And there's a lot to Aunt Mimi that really is quite, quite unlikable and unsympathetic that has been coming out since her death. And, you know, so I didn't think it was as true to the story as most of us fans who are familiar with the literature are going to know about. But I did think that they got some of the bold strokes right. I do think that he had a really complicated relationship with his mother. Um, I do think that that rivalry between those two sisters was very pronounced and, you know, kind of mysterious. And um, obviously the loss of his mother at 17 was, a, you know, a major blow to him. So, I don't know, it got a lot right. I don't know, it was, it's not my favorite Beatle movie, but, I, you know, I've seen, I've seen much worse. <laughs> I pretty much agree with you there because I, I know there was a lot of hype when the movie came out about how it was the true, you know, the true story of John and, and uh, it was pretty clear to me that it was, it was, you know, just an, I mean, it, it wasn't bad, but it was an acting job. That's, there's no question about that. Well, Paul McCartney did say in response to this film that Aunt Mimi wasn't as cruel as she's made out to be. So, you know, I would think well, that Paul would know better than most of us. Yeah, well, you know, you have to, I mean, with Aunt Mimi, you have to, you have to make several decisions. One is the generation she came from and the more age that she was involved in. Very Victorian, very strict. You know, according to um, Julia Lynn and his half-sister, Mimi was, Mimi was a virgin until she had an affair with one of her student lodgers. So she had some kind of, some really severe sexual dysfunction, because if she was not even sleeping with Uncle George... That was, that's just, I mean, I don't know. I just think that's, I mean, the sexual mores of that generation are really weird. Then you have to decide whether you're going to include this tidbit that's in the Pete Shotton book, which is, does she, does she put Lennon's dog Sally down? When Lennon, when she's angry at Lennon for, for going off and visiting Julia one too many times, does she put his dog down? Hmm. Um, that's in uh, Julia Lennon's book. That's in Pete Shotton's book. It's very, you know, that's a very troubling incident to me, and that's something I don't think that a teenage boy would have an easy time with. I think when you're reflecting on how you were brought up and who your mother figure was, I think if she puts your dog down, I think that's a big strike against her. So, mm -hmm. well, let me get your take on historians something. Historians disagree about this. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think Shotton is reliable in, in enough ways that I, I sort of went with it. When it comes to the whole relationship between Mimi and Julia, what is the story that you really believe? Because for so many years we were led to believe, and I suppose this is Mimi's version, that, you know, Julia was this carefree, irresponsible person, as was Alfred, the father, who didn't really want to take care of, of John. And, um, you know, that... that I just don't really know. The, the way that you explain it in your book, and I think a lot of it comes from Alfred's book, is that yeah. Alfred really wanted to take care of John, although yeah. it was extremely cruel, <laughs> obviously, to make him choose between his mother and his father. So was Alfred really this, this bum, <laughs> as Mimi would want us to believe, or was he really far more responsible and he really wanted to look after John? Because, well, you know, I'm just bringing this up only because recently I, I interviewed David Bedford, who I think you know, yeah. having uh, written the book Liddy Pole, and he was saying that Mimi took John away from Julia. The way that you explain it in your book, and again, probably a lot of it's from Alfred's book, is that, you know, Julia really just let Mimi have him because yeah. her boyfriend didn't want to raise John, yeah. and, and he wanted uh, sons of his own, or children of his own. Yeah. So it was yeah, Mimi. That's a piece of it too. With Alfred, you have to take his book with a grain of salt um, because he's, you know, he's narrating himself, and um, you know, I'm sure that there are there are ways in which he inflates his good behavior and, and tries to downplay his bad behavior. My judgment was that there was enough credibility to his to his Blackpool scenes. There's a lot of stuff in Blackpool there that really makes him look bad that he includes that he could have not included, and I decided that his his take on Blackpool was actually was kind of balanced. So, I mean, you have to you have to take Alf's book with a grain of salt, but I think that he does tell some stuff, a lot of stuff that's true, and he he relates some scenes that are not that complimentary to him. So that gives that makes me trust him for the stuff that he's talking about, where he he actually does some good things. The problem is the first five years of Lennon's life, he is largely absent 
And then between Blackpool and Hard Day's Night, he is absent from Lennon's life, or, you know, 98% absent. And the life that he lives after uh, the Blackpool scene is really quite, you know, it's really a hand-to-mouth existence. Uh, it's a bum's life. So uh, the people who try to say he's not a bum or Mimi's making him out to be a bum, he really was a bum. He lived a bum's life. Um, mm-hmm. He was a dishwasher. And so there's that. There's, um, I mean, I just think there's something very fierce about that sibling rivalry between Julia and Mimi, that Mimi always spoke about how she wanted John. She felt like John was hers. She felt like Julia had this kid and that the kid was always hers. I think there's something very dark and mysterious about that relationship that had never really been explored uh, by other biographers that I wanted to go into a little bit more. To me, it seems really freaky that Julia would let Mimi take the child, and it's a very complicated situation where she is trying to settle down with this new husband. She does want to start a new family with him, and so that all of those factor, all of those things factor in there. And also, you got to bring up the fact, you know, was was Mimi really this cruel? You do say in the book that for many years she never told John that Julia lived a couple miles away. Right. Right, and that's another that's another piece of the competitive edge which she had with her sister, and feeling like she didn't want John to keep getting hurt by her sister. But then she does, you know. Then then the really tragic thing happens is that John does get close to his mother for a couple of years before she dies. Now, of course, Julia can't control. I mean, Mimi can't control that. That's this unexpected thing that happens. But it does kind of dub, it doubles down on um, you know uh, John's tragedy and. Mimi not being warm, Mimi being kind of so different from her sister, you know, I don't know. I, it's very, very complicated. Again, I don't think people have written about these relationship issues with much sophistication before. Let me let me move ahead uh, a little bit about the meeting of um, John and Paul. Um, one of the things that uh, has been one of the um, myths that has gone around was that John was drunk that day and then... and. Um, Members of the quorum and said, "No, no, no, that's not true." What did you, what did you what did you find out about the the meeting that day between John and Paul? Yeah, so my best source for that meeting that day was Rod Davis, who was one of the quorum men. And you know, there's pieces of it that have that have entered the myth that he just claims just can't possibly be true. He he points out that none of them had any money, no one would have served them any alcohol. That if John did have beer on his breath, the way Paul seems to remember in some interviews. He would have had to have sneaked off and done it on his own somehow, um, and that this they just weren't doing this at this point. They just were not. They were more. They they just were not getting in that kind of trouble sneaking off drinks together. And that if John was drunk, he was likely the only person who was drunk there. So I think that John. I think Paul probably has a lot of memories of John with beer on his breath, and you know has gotten his memories confused of that first day and maybe part of it is just feeling really intimidated and though there's this older kid and he's behaving very cocky and that um paul assumes that he was drunk i mean i don't you know i don't know what's going on there Mm -hmm. but rod davis was adamant to me that uh he he really did not believe that john uh, would be aptly described as drunk on that day he has no memory of of anybody doing any drinking that day Hmm. what kind of what kind of attitude did john had have toward paul that day yeah, so they always describe John as being incredi- having a very tough exterior and being always being bossy and being the leader and being very verbally aggressive um, and assaultive. But, you know, once Paul uh, has the guitar in his hands, he's very impressive, and Lennon shuts up and is very impressed but is not about to say anything out loud <laughs> and, of course, keeps his council and doesn't invite Paul to join the band for a couple more days, and that's his way of exerting leadership and, and showing who, you know, who's in control. But they said that everyone who was in that room is very impressed with what Paul is able to do, that Paul is really quite accomplished on the guitar, and there's no question that they're in the presence of a big talent there. And I believe all that. Tim, you go into uh, the Hamburg years in your book, aside from the fact that we all know that the Beatles developed into a great live band, what kind of an effect did Hamburg have on John as a person and developing him as a person? Well, I think, you know, I think that Hamburg sort of gave him a lot of license to indulge in all of the, um, all the bad behaviors that were so, um, 
wayward for him in Liverpool that made him, you know, that made him such a uh, uh, a local tough and a, a bad boy and a you know somebody that the parents said, oh, don't hang out with that guy; he'll just get you in trouble. And in Hamburg, it was, you know, he just. He just was able to stroll down these streets and see that all these people behaving with all this license and that this was, you know, he could just indulge in all of this sex and drugs and rock and roll in uh, quantities that were unimaginable back in Liverpool in ways that were, you know, where just no parental figure is going to tamp you down for it, you know. Uh, It's almost like a prestige matter. And uh, so he sort of of becomes a rock star in Hamburg – because um, it's just available to him. And, you know, he still is, I think he's still probably quite depressed and grieving over the death of his mother at that point, and that it's still, it's kind of an extension of the bender that he goes on after his mother dies. Because once you're drinking heavily in your grief after your mother dies, you know, you're, you know, you don't sort of wake up after two years and say, oh, now I'm going to start drinking for a completely different reason, you know. He's still just heavily medicating a deep, you know, lots of pain that's trapped in there since his mother's death. Um, and I think that music is a great release valve for him, and the sex and the drugs are the other, the other things that he just reaches for instinctively. And when it, when it's kind of, when there's that degree of freedom about it, I mean, think of a teenager set loose in uh, Las Vegas, you know, and just like just just living the Vegas life, you know, making money, having money to spend and having being surrounded by all those temptations. I mean, I think he really went I think he really went overboard. He's not a person, you know, nobody ever describes him as somebody who knew how to do things halfway. He was always overboard with everything, and I think it was I think he sort of became a rock star in his head at that point in Hamburg. Hmm. Let me um uh, I'm going to um push ahead to um uh, John and Cynthia. It's it's interesting to me that was the John and Cynthia marriage the ideal marriage uh, as far as, you know, up until they met, and up until John and Yoko came together? Was that the ideal marriage? No, I think it was really, I think they both felt like they were struggling a lot in that marriage um, very, very quickly. I mean, you know, uh, Lennon is very absent. Um, they're, they're married in August of 63, right as the recording career is beginning to take off. 62, isn't it? He's absent. I mean, he's traveling all the time, and then mm-hmm. he, and he gets very, very famous so quickly, and the marriage really suffers. And he gets married for the wrong reason, of course. So he's trying to do the right thing. He's knocked up his girlfriend. They do seem to be sincerely in love with each other, but they're not very well suited to each other. In fact, I think one of the one of the more interesting quotes that nobody has played up very, um, very interestingly was the way Cynthia says in one of her books. She says, "Why don't you?" Try going out with that Yoko person. She seems much more suited to you. You know, I mean, the Cynthia says this, and Cynthia knows when they go to India in the beginning of 1968. She knows that Lenin is uh, been philandering. She knows the marriage is really in trouble. She knows that he has been attracted to Yoko. That Yoko is sending him all these postcards. She understands that they're really, they're really. Um, held together by a thread and that the the marriage is not likely to survive. You know, Lennon even has told different insiders that he's thinking of taking Yoko too, taking both Yoko and his wife to India. <laughs> that would have been messy. Right, who's really <laughs> making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. So, no, I don't think it's a good marriage. I think it was, you know, a, you know, I wish that I wish that Lennon had, I don't know, Lennon's behavior in that marriage and the way he gets out of the marriage, it's all really does not speak well for his character. You know, he's really, he feels trapped. He feels trapped for a long time. He's very jealous of how McCartney leads a dashing bachelor's life in London. And um, this, isn't, this just isn't, you know, it just is not a good, healthy psychic space. And it drives him further into drugs. That's the way I sort of saw it. Well, they really were married because John was attracted to Cynthia and because she got pregnant. And that's the main reasons. <laughs> And also That's because right. they, they shared uh, their love of art together. Yep. All right, let's talk a little bit about Stu Sutcliffe. How much of an impact did Stu have on John's life, his friendship, and his death? Yeah, so I really fell in love with Stu as I started researching him, and I got to talk with Astrid Kircher, and she was a really fascinating interview. She still sleeps with a picture of Stuart by her bed. And I really? Think, I think, yeah, that's what she told me. <laughs> And I think that Astrid had, you know, 
almost as much a, as an effect on Lenin because she was like a new sporty type of a person, an arty person, a person of ideas, you know, a person who was committed to art and to culture and the world of ideas. And I, I think this was kind of dazzling. And the, the fact that they all were, you know, participating in inventing rock and roll and extending the idea of rock and roll, of seeing all these modern art ideas in, in rock and roll, that's another thing I wanted to write about that other people hadn't explored that much, was he's definitely into modern art. Astrid used to tell me that he, one of the favorite things he and Stu used to do was be to go to art museums in Hamburg and talk about art all day. Just go to the museums and just discuss what they were looking at. You know, it's very telling that when uh, when Stuart meets Eduardo Palazzi, he actually recognizes him in a crowded Hamburg bar. And this guy is Eduardo Palazzi, and he is now in Hamburg, and Stu recognizes him. That means Stu is paying attention to the pop art movement that is just then emerging in Britain and not really quite emerging yet in America, and that that shows that how tuned in they are to the art, the uh, uh, intellectual currents that are flowing through modern art. And uh, uh, this was something that they that Lenin felt intuitively was also coursing through rock and roll, and, and these connections, these intellectual ideas, were things that he was pursuing in the music that he felt, you know, were coursing through the music as well. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense that they uh, met at art school, that they adopted the music together. I think he was very conflicted that Stu dropping out of the band and devoting his life to art and, and studying, staying, falling in love with Astrid and staying in Hamburg, realizing that, you know, his passion was going to be for art, not for music, Lennon understood it, but it was also very complicated for him. He felt like, you know, his very best mate, the person he was closest to in the world, besides Cynthia, was was abandoning him. And he's a guy who didn't really like like abandonment that much. Had suffered too much abandonment, even though he was sort of uh, he was understanding of it. So then there's the scene where he beats up Stu because he's drunk and angry about what's going on, and how much does that have to do with Stu, Stu getting sick, you know, and Stu. Stu's own sister writes a book saying she thinks John killed him, and then she writes another book saying oh, she doesn't think John killed him after all. So there's this very complicated thing where you have to decide, okay, well, does Lennon carry this guilt with him? And I think Lennon probably did carry a certain degree of guilt about that fight. And I also think he carried a certain degree of guilt of just, like, not remembering and not knowing what happened. He was probably in a blackout. He probably was not, did not have his wits about him. And then, then of course, Stuart dying is really... You know, it's just one more in a long succession of people who he's very close to dying on him, and he takes that ultra personally, and that happens right as the right as the career is about to ignite, and that's another very uh, very strong blow. Um, I, you know, I think Stewart is a is a very profound influence, and we don't have enough. It's interesting. We're still kind of pawing through every single letter and all the artworks and trying to make sense of who this guy was, what he was like. It's like the historical record. We don't have enough evidence of what that relationship was like. All, you know, the echoes of that relationship, the, the distant kind of imprint that it made on Lennon. We can only hear it through Lennon's music and through his later relationships. And that he, you know, he obviously later settled down with the, you know, a very famous avant-garde artist. The idea of art and devoting one's life to art was really, really central to Lennon's life. And you know, I don't, I don't think you can overstate Stu's influence on him. Can I just ask one thing about this? Because do you think, given what you just said, between losing Julia, you know, Alfred also abandoning him, and then Stu dying, that, that John was kind of like a walking time bomb? Up yeah. until, say, when Plastic Auto Band came out, and then he unleashed all that to the world, and he was able yeah. to cover it up through the Beatles. Yeah, and he also was really quite heavily medicated. I mean, the, the, the key puzzle that I encountered when I got into this book and researching it and really understanding how heavily medicated he was and how completely withdrawn he was from the world you know the beatles were they were his sanest expression of his of his self and they were the healthiest expression of his life the beatles allowed him to be you know this one healthy outlet every other aspect of his life was pretty unhealthy all the way through Plastic Ono Band. I mean, Plastic Ono Band is kind of the, that's where the plumbing just kind of just starts leaking from all the pl pressure. You know, that, that's when the pressure valves give out. But um, it's very, very interesting to consider how productive he is given 
how heavily drugged he is most of the Beatles' career. And hmm. some of that is, Obviously, he leads a very sheltered existence. He's driven everywhere. He doesn't have the same responsibilities that a lot of people have. He doesn't do housework. He doesn't have chores. He doesn't have, you know, he has enough money to be, to sort of be buffered from a lot of incidental stresses that every other person has in their everyday life. And it allows him to simply be a creative artist who shows up at the studio with his very best friends, and they're able to buoy him and help sustain him, even though he's really... You know, just, I mean, Arthur Janoff says this guy showed up and had more pain than anybody he'd ever seen in his whole life. And you can hear that in his voice. You can hear this guy is carrying around a lot of pain. But it took him a long time to get anywhere near, you know, sort of conscious recognition of that and that he had to deal with that and that he wasn't going to be happy until he started to deal with it. And he had many, many setbacks and many, many reversals where. You know, he just couldn't, he wasn't ready to sort of figure that out. So, I mean, I think it's an amazing, I can't think of any other artist where they are as productive as this guy was, and yet every single report you find is, you know, I had many, many people say to me, it's amazing that he lived, you know, because he just was such a, he was, you know, he was not a light drinker through the whole thing either. I mean, you know, lesser people have died just from the drink that he did, that he did during that time. Mm. Given what you said about Stewart and about Astrid and his 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 love of art, it's not that much of a stretch then that he hooked up with Yoko, right? Yeah, and Yoko is, um, you know, it's very funny how uh, he 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 is initially titillated and sort of drawn to Yoko at that art show, and then she pursues him quite aggressively. And I mean, that, there's something very interesting in there too about how. He is immensely attracted to her, but it takes him a long time to sort of get in touch with it. That shows how out of touch he is with his own feelings. Because once he does recognize those feelings and start acting on them, he acts on them incredibly rashly, incredibly naively, and incredibly, um, you know, wickedly in the way he treats all everybody around him by uh, by dumping his wife and child and just moving, go, running off with Yoko. Literally the next day, I mean, what Pete Shotton describes in his book is he invites Yoko over, they stay up all night, and the next morning at breakfast, Lennon announces he's going to commit his life to Yoko Ono. I mean, it's really a very uh, adolescent impulse that he follows in doing that, and Yoko does represent for him, I mean, you, you got to, it does kind of fit the Lennon character when he just says quite baldly and blankly, you know, she's everything I've ever wanted. She's this really great artist, and she's got more ideas than anyone I've ever met, and she's unlike anyone I've ever met, and I just can't, you know, I just can't, like, I can't do anything but just run off with her at this point. And it's very impulsive, and it's very uh, heedless of every other, every person, every other person's feelings, and, and it causes a boatload of pain, and it takes them a long time to sort of figure out how to even make that relationship sustainable. We're going to try and wrap things up here. I I do want to ask you a couple more questions, and even though we're jumping ahead here, about John's solo career, I'm going to read a quote from you regarding the competitive feeling that he had with Paul. You say, uh, and I'm quoting you, the theme that grew increasingly more intense during Lennon's solo career was his ongoing competition with Paul McCartney for a hit single, career reversal, or defining moment, the song, album, or tour, when either might confidently step outside the other's shadow. Do you believe that, that John was always competing with Paul or the other Beatles? Wasn't he happy for the other's success? Uh, yeah, I do think he was happy for the other's success, but I do think that just the way that within the Beatles there was always a level of competition between them, even when they were collaborating, and I say collaborating with quotes around it because that collaboration was always you know, sort of mix and match, and it was sometimes intense, and it was sometimes they were very separate about their work, but the key competitive impulse he has in the solo career is definitely with Paul. But in a way... Because I, I, I actually thought it was the other way around, that Paul was the one that that was felt in competition with him and, and did several things, that John, you know, in following what John did. Oh, I'm not saying it's not the other way around. I mean, I, I think they both were, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think Let Me Roll It is Paul doing John, and I think Imagine is the weird, this weird kind of thing where where John is in bed with both Paul and Yoko in that song. I mean, in a very weird way. 
<laughs> in the song Imagine? Yeah. How does Imagine have to do... Yeah. referring to... Right, oh. stylistically. I never, I never looked at it that uh, way. Yeah, just sitting here thinking about that for a second. It's an interesting... Uh, you can see... There's, I think there's arguments for and against that. But, yeah, you can... You can kind of kind of see that, uh, you know, there there are arguments to be made for that. I can see them. But in the Beatles, but, the the competition between John and Paul was a healthy thing. So why wouldn't well, you yeah, why but, wouldn't you see yeah, it that but, way with the solo careers? Well, I you know I'm not saying it was unhealthy with the solo careers. I'm saying it was there. I'm saying that you can't imagine you can't imagine any of those solo careers without a, the competitive impulse they were feeling, and they were boxing with their own ghosts. They're always boxing with the ghost of their legacy, yeah, and they're always looking over their shoulder and saying, "Oh, well, Paul's doing this, you know." So, I mean, his—I think John Lennon's the best example of that is John Lennon's interpretation of "Too Many People," the lead track on Ram, which is just wildly projective of all these references and all these, you know. And it—I really don't think too many people wa- was was this big attack on John and Yoko, um, but Lennon heard it as this uh, as this scalding attack on everything they were doing and uh, i mean i think that's that's proof that you know lennon felt like paul was you know you know watching his every move and i think that they i think on certain levels they were well paul did admit that the song was about him and yoko he did say yeah, that well yes but but lennon's reading of it i think is wildly over projected okay I mean, if if you if you listen to the lyrics, uh, too many people going underground. You took your lucky break and broke it in two. You know that's a reference there to the friendship that could be easily interpreted that that way. So that's certainly directed towards John. Yeah, I guess I guess we disagree. I mean, I think it is, but I think it's more poetic than that. I think it's not merely about that. I think a song like Dear Friends is much more explicitly, directly about the songwriting partnership falling apart. Hmm. Too many people is is open ended enough that it's about it could be about it, that stuff explicitly, but it's also, you know, it it works on other levels. Okay. Okay. So, Tim, it's been great having you as a guest. And, hey, uh, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. I I hope you come on more often because we barely scratched the surface here. You know, with we John, really did. there's so many things you can talk about when it comes to John Lennon. He he had a short life, but he had a fascinating life on so many levels. You can just pick apart one topic about John's life, and that could be a show. So uh, to just try to cover it in a half an hour or a little bit more is really difficult. <laughs> so by all means, we welcome you back to the show whenever you want to be a guest. And uh, much success with your book on John called Lennon. Great. Thank you so much. And if people want to, they can uh, order your book on, on uh, Amazon. And uh, any other way they can purchase your book? You know, it's at fine bookstores everywhere. And if people want to get in touch with you, can they do so through your website? Yeah. So go to timreillyauthor.com. Okay. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Thank My you, pleasure. Tim. Thank you. All right. This has been a lot of fun talking to Tim Riley, the author of the new book on John called Lennon. I'm Ken Michaels. Thanking you so much for being here. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying we will see you next time. <laughs>